to all who receive him. To those who believe in his name, Jesus gives the right to be called the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today are words of uh, the gospel lesson, a, a portion of it, uh, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to uh, take just this section in which Jesus talks to us uh, about uh, the sin of murder, uh, but then also leads us to see where that stands in terms of both the feelings inside of us and the words that we speak, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. So if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the, the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when I began my ministry almost 35 years ago, Various uh, groups from uh, American evangelicalism, like uh, Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority, James Dobson's Focus on the Family, Don Wildman's American Family Association, uh, Pat Robertson's Christian Coalition, were making a lot of noise in the so-called culture wars. We agreed with them on some of the things that they said about the sinfulness of abortion or pornography or sex outside of marriage and, 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 and other uh, issues uh, like those. But the Lutheran Church has always taken a little different approach when it comes to uh, trying to foster moral behavior. We, we don't involve the church in political battles. And we, we don't so much push God's law without putting an equal or greater emphasis on his gospel at the same time. Now, in these cultural battles that have been going on for, you know, who knows how long, sometimes you'll hear people say things like, you can't legislate morality. And that is true, but not for the reason sometimes people think. Every law that we've had on our books forever against things like murder or theft or rape is an attempt to legislate morality at some level. Every law that uh, would speak about prohibitions of discrimination against people based on religion, race, gender or sexual orientation are also trying to legislate um, a morality. And in as much as those kinds of laws can be a deterrent, they may help in the direction they're trying to go, but we all understand that just because you have a law doesn't mean that everybody's going to obey it. There are always going to be those people who choose to disobey the law instead. The Bible not only offers a different way of promoting moral behavior, it, it has a different standard, a, 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 a distinctly different standard altogether. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus helps us to understand both these, different, the different way in which morality is presented and the different kind of standard that the Bible would lay before us. Uh, in these words, he helps us see that morals are more than mere externals. 
properly understood, they are matters of the heart. And they are concerned with good relationships. And they call for urgent application. The popular idea about how morals work in Jesus' day was not so different than how people often look at them today. Uh, that people want to define them in such a way as that they might be easy to keep. That uh, they are something that you can kind of aspire to to do and thus people will be able to claim for themselves I am a good person but in order for that to be the case they, they have to be defined somewhat in a shallow way uh, they have to be kind of kept at the level of externals and there Jesus does not let us go for he shows us that they are matters truly matters of the heart you have heard that it was said to our ancestors do not murder and whoever murders will be subject to judgment but I tell you everyone who's angry with his brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Of course, Jesus takes no issue with uh, murder itself being a sin. Of, of course, he has to support that. Everybody does. This is one of God's Ten Commandments, the Fifth Commandment, that was handed down by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. It is almost universally recognized. It's a bad thing to do. Don't, don't kill somebody at least under ordinary circumstances, don't do it. But the Pharisees of Jesus' day, and frankly almost everybody else, would have a tendency to say, well, I haven't killed anybody. I've never committed murder. I've kept God's commandments. See, I'm a good person. And this is the point of God's concern. Yes, he wants to keep people alive, but he is looking for something so much more than that. He wants uh, not only that we actually do on the outside what the commandments have to say. He's not only concerned with what we do to other people, but he's concerned at the same time that in our hearts we hold an attitude of love towards them. He, he wants that we would want the best for others. And that he wants this at all times from us, without exception. That is why everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. But, but, but we might be tempted to say, well, wh what about righteous anger? Jesus had righteous anger, right? When he went and cleansed the temple, when he drove the money changers out of the temple. What, well, wasn't Jesus angry? Wasn't that a, a righteous anger on his part? Isn't righteous anger okay? And granted, yes, there may be times when a sense of righteousness uh, leads us to have anger when we see some injustice because we also have a love for the victim. Jesus, too, was angry when he saw how the, the, the noise of the business that was being conducted there at the temple got in the way of the worshipers being able to learn and to worship God. But let's be honest. What is it that makes us angry? Really, mostly. Isn't it because someone has done something that offends me? Isn't it because we are concerned about ourselves? Someone cuts us off in traffic. Maybe because they are careless. Maybe because they were distracted. Maybe because uh, they're just an aggressive driver and our blood boils. We yell at them inside the car or we want to use sign language to let them know how we really feel about what they just did. So, is that anger really because we're just so concerned, we just have such a heart of concern about the safety of the other drivers on the road? Are, are, are we really in our hearts so concerned that, that that bad driver do better? Or are we just mad about the way they invaded our space and risked an accident? Uh, can, can, can we honestly say that we love them just the same, that we really want the best for them? 
just as much as before they came careening into our lane. We get angry with people for the great sin of disagreeing with our opinion. Because they don't do what we want. Because their incompetence has cost us money. Because they forgot what we said to them. Because they have embarrassed us in public because they've created an inconvenience for us. Because they have called into question our honor and integrity. Because they have taken advantage of our kindness. Because they're just not nice. Now, don't misunderstand. Jesus does not require us to sign up for abuse. Sometimes we may have certain situations that have to be dealt with in a certain way. Uh, maybe we have to put a little distance between ourselves and our abuser. But he still condemns the bitterness and the resentment that wants something less than good for somebody else. That We'd like to see them have some pain, that thirst for revenge, that's unwilling to forgive, if only temporarily. God still condemns the anger that lessens the place of love in our hearts. And that is subject to his judgment. It doesn't matter whether this is directed at a friend or a family member or somebody who's a complete stranger. Our hearts are wrong. Our morals then are a sham. And if we externally maintain only a, an illusion of a moral control, God's judgment is there. Well, just take this example for example. Uh, imagine that the authorities have attacked you and falsely accused you. They arrest you and they find you guilty of crimes you never committed. As your sentence, they drive nails through your hands and feet that fasten you to beams of wood on which they hang you to die. Reason for anger? If there ever was one. But how did Jesus respond? First words from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And if Jesus' words confront us, well, then good then perhaps we can give up on our pathetic claim, I am a good person. Then we are uh, ready to admit our guilt. Perhaps we cannot entirely free of ourselves of the anger uh, that may exist in our hearts, but at least we come to understand better the seriousness and the depth of the problem within. We can stop pretending. We can stop deceiving ourselves. And true to his own word, Jesus is sincere and genuine about what he has to say about anger here. He, sa he practices what he preaches. And so he doesn't look at our anger. He doesn't look at our moral failure and respond with a moral outrage on his part. No, when he says, Father, forgive them, he, he means it sincerely. And that it applies to you and me as well, is to that thief or to the, the soldiers who were nailing him to the cross. That's the very nature of our God. It's what he is like in the Psalms. A thousand years earlier, David had uh, this to say, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Well, that is so much better than a list of uh, moral requirements or just some stricter laws. It's the grace of God. 
that has the possibility of working its way into our hearts and actually working a change there to replace our anger with some compassion. Like, like his moral standards, God's grace is not just an external matter. It is a matter of the heart, both his and ours. Well, once we come to understand uh, that this is a matter of the heart, well, then we are better in a place to understand the, the true purpose of God's commands, what it is that he's trying to accomplish with all of this, because it, it, the morals are, are more than a matter of mere externals, but they are concerned with good relationships. So if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Keeping God's laws is not about looking good to others. It is about getting along with them. Consider what this means for our life of worship. Going to church, going to church is not a matter of looking respectable in the eyes of the public, nor is it a, an attempt to try to impress God. He doesn't need anything that we're giving. He doesn't need our offerings. He doesn't need our songs. He doesn't need our prayers. The main point of worship runs entirely in the other direction. Well, he may be happy with the fact that we praise him, but we are the ones who need him and what he has to offer we need the peace that we find in his promises. So we come and here we can leave our guilt and take his grace home with us instead. We need the hope that we find in his presence. We're not alone in our daily fight. We find him. We find him here again so that we can take him with us out there. But how can our hearts be open to receive these gifts of God when we're not even having hearts that are open to receive the other people that are gifts to us in life? Those people who are as much the children of God as we are. And how he can he be pleased with our praises when we don't even care about the other members of his family? Can that make him happy? Children who don't get along? In the picture that Jesus paints for us, it may not even be us, the ones who are so angry about the relationship with somebody else. Uh, your, your brother or sister, Jesus says, has something against you. Well, fine, we think. Have it your way. I will just go my own way. I will just leave you alone. I will just avoid you instead. No, Jesus says. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. God doesn't want your money, at least not as a high priority. He's got all he needs. He can go find money anywhere, anytime he wants. He wants his family to get along. He wants his children to love each other and to share with each other that love with which he himself has loved them. That's the purpose of most of his commandments. If we understand them properly, true morals then are more than a matter of some external behavior that we might uh, manage to uh, keep. Uh, they are concerned with good relationships and that means reaching out and, and, and trying to repair them even when we're not the ones who are frankly holding the anger inside, even when we're not the ones who broke those relationships in the first place. It's nothing to take lightly. This is nothing to just let slide. We'll take care of this when we get around to it someday. But this deals with real people, human souls, and as a result, uh, someone's even e eternal fate may be hanging in the balance. And so Jesus would remind us that this matter of morals is more than just mere externals. They call for urgent application. 
Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. Jesus concludes with a little parable here. He pictures the people who are angry with us or the ones that we are angry with ourselves uh, as being like adversaries going to court. Well, the court of law, of course, would be God's own court. And let it not be that our anger or our lack of love and concern would lead us all the way to the end of God, where God's court waits. How would we ever be able to stand before the judge? The Apostle John warns in his first letter, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we harbor our anger and our resentments all the way to the day of judgment, it will not go well for us. No matter how well we acted on the outside, our morals are not right because our morals, our hearts, are not right. And our hearts are not right because we lacked the faith to take God's word seriously, both his word of warning and his word of grace. Jesus is not afraid to draw this conclusion. You will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. Is that part of the picture hard to interpret? The prison, of course, is hell, the final destination for those who held God's love at bay, who refused to receive God's own love to the very end. Hard words, but Jesus does not mean to upset you. He does not mean to terrify you. He is not trying just to make you mad. He's trying to spare us, like the doctor who delivers the diagnosis of some deadly disease. Take the medicine while it is available. Drink in God's grace for yourself, first of all. Receive his forgiveness. As much as he gives away, trust him, trust him. Trust his word. Trust his love. And then you will also want to be reconciled to the people who make you angry as well. Good morals don't save us. They are evidence that we have been saved. And that, like the morals themselves, is not a matter of mere externals. It is God on the outside who works real change within. Amen. Please stand.